Welcome to Blend's Localization Leader Series, where we interview industry leaders who are paving the way for advances in localization through their work. In this episode, we're joined by Plio's Senior Content Localization Manager, Diana Georgieva. Plio is a centralized business spending solution for forward-thinking teams. All right, Diana, so we usually like to start just by getting some background. Um, so yeah, if you can just start by telling us a little bit about your career path and how you became the Senior Content Localization Manager at Playo. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, uh, Kareem, for, for having me. It's a pleasure to speak with you. So um, as you mentioned, I'm currently uh, the um, Senior Localization Manager at Playo. Uh, but for me, um, joining uh, the localization industry started kind of sort of as a natural career path. I've always been, um, since an early age, very interested in language, uh, in translation, um, and then my background is uh, in um, global languages and international business. But my first job uh, was uh, in the localization industry was uh, as an LQA tester for Bulgarian language for Nokia phones. I don't know if you remember that. Well, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> And uh, I did that while I was uh, studying, um, while I was working on my degree in uh, Mandarin in in Beijing. Uh, And then uh, later on, I moved to Copenhagen uh, in uh, Denmark, uh, where I've uh, held different positions within the localization industry. So I started in um, in, on the agency side, where I learned the ropes in project management, account management in in localization. Then about seven years ago. I switched over to the client side, so I've worked for um, global tech companies, helping them on their marketing and uh, product uh, content localization programs. And I have the privilege to to be working at Clio at the moment. Uh, we are a global fintech company uh, specializing in um, spin management. Yes, now we're familiar with the, your brand and it's great. So how many languages do you guys support today? Do you know uh, so it? today, as, as pure languages, uh, we have 11 and uh, we uh, maintain 16 locales. So we are uh, and, and we're working awesome. on ex- further expansion. Great. Um, and so how would you say your team is structured, Your the localization department? Every company does it a bit differently. Yeah. So um, we are a small agile team. We have uh, two localization engineers, uh, two localization operations specialists. Um, we work with a trusted uh, language services provider, LSP, and then mm-hmm. we also uh, collaborate uh, with, uh, with a network of uh, freelance copywriters who are specialists in marketing, SEO optimization, and such for markets. So that's, that's sort of how we structure it. So we are, we're centralized, essentially. Amazing. And what do you, what would you say is Playo's uh, greatest localization strength? Ah, that's a very good question. Very interesting question. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd say it's it's uh, the people, both in the expertise that lies within the folks in the team. Uh, everyone is very very experienced in what they do, and then mm-hmm. also uh, in the leadership support that we get. Uh, I know that a lot of folks struggle with that in in, in localization fo- uh, function, and we're we're privileged and uh, and lucky to to have a lot of backing uh, from from um, our leadership teams uh, to to enable us to work on uh, innovation. Yeah, that's great. I'm I'm sure you probably haven't experienced that at every every localization role that you've had because um, it tends to go the opposite way, like you said. Absolutely. It varies. And it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's something that, you know, maybe it's, it's quite overlooked. That it's it, uh, one mm. of the backers of success is, is having that, that, yes. sh- that support and investment. Yes, absolutely. Um, do you have any advice maybe for uh, a localization manager that's struggling to show the value of localization? To, yeah. to leadership yeah absolutely so I think that's that's an, that's an, always an ongoing uh, topic and an ongoing struggle mm-hmm. within the localization issue because we are positioned uh, we're not at at, uh, at the very forefront we're not uh, client facing so mm-hmm. how do we measure that uh, return on investment and this is something that um, my team and I are currently 
working um, and focusing on. So how do we tie what we do um, to specific business outcomes and, and demonstrate the value that we bring and the so-called return on investment on localization so that we are not just seen as a call center. And there are different ways to do that. We are based actually in the product side of the organization, though, so that helps a lot because we have um, a lot of metrics that we track. So we track our pers- uh, our team metrics and then, and then try to measure how those attribute to conversion, to retention of active users, um, and, um, and and yeah, so, so that would be my advice to uh, work with uh, leaders or experts outside of the team mm. and, and see what, what kind of metrics they're tracking and see how, how you can collaborate and, and tie those to, to the overall business strategy and business metrics. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, did you find that there were any markets in particular that were challenging to break into so far or or not not really yeah so that's that's also that's also an interesting question so we we were on a very ambitious expansion journey last year so 2022 mm. was, was a huge growth year for us uh, and we expanded into 10 new markets in less than 10 months wow wow so that that's was, amazing that was, that was a journey and that was the, <laughs> the, a learning curve uh, definitely mm-hmm. for some of our teams and i'll say Looking back, one of the biggest reflections maybe is uh, that, uh, you know, originally we we are a Nordic company. So a lot of um, our philosophy in building products, in, in, um, in the way we communicate, is rooted in Nordic values. Uh, for example, trust. We have a very, very high level of trust in, in society, in Scandinavia, um, and uh, empowerment. But then as we started expanding in other places throughout Europe, uh, there was a learning curve around how you know those those concepts don't necessarily match the needs of, of or or the way we communicate around them doesn't match. So maybe there are some some markets that have um a more a stronger hierarchy uh, than the flat hierarchy we have here or um, there's a stronger preference for more formal communication in the B2B space because essentially mm-hmm. we operate in the B2B space, yeah. but at the same time we have a very casual, um, friendly tone of voice in our brand. So how do we translate that? How do we further adapt that to when we, when we go to markets where maybe that's not uh, expected or uh, applicable? That was kind of a challenging exercise. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Wow, but this sounds amazing. 10 markets in 10 months. That's a huge accomplishment. So I'm sure it was challenging, but but very rewarding as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. And so you mentioned that your team is sort of quite small within and then you work with LSPs and freelancers. So are those freelancers sort of international? You're working with people in different time zones and that sort of challenge, or do you find that actually your communication is quite smooth? Um, I think communication was, um, we are all on, on Slack. That's our main tool for mm. communication. Then we, we try also to, to reach um, uh, for conversations beyond Slack messages and emails and, and prioritize that and have time. But one of the challenges I think also is that um, mm, my team itself, we're not co-located. We are working across different time zones, different cultures. Mm-hmm. None of us are in the same country, actually. Oh, so, wow. uh, Interesting. So that, 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 that is fun. We we do bring mm-hmm. a lot of different perspectives, a lot of diversity to the thought process. So we have we cover a lot of languages between ourselves uh, already within the team, which is great. But then uh, what, what we try to do more of is meet in person. And we have people working from anywhere remotely. Um, and some of that, um, I don't know, maybe it's nostalgia. When I look back in the day where, you know, you knew everyone in the office and you have to go yes. to a physical location. Yes. It's kind of um, building that relationship on a day-to-day basis uh, was, was somewhat easier. So what we do with the team and most teams at Clear uh, is that we have, uh, we try to meet in real life all together in the same location at least six months, six, every six months. Mm-hmm. We call it a uh, mini team camp. Cute. And the last oh. one um, that myself and the team did was uh, in Istanbul uh, last wow. year. And 
and um, yeah, we had a lot of fun. So besides, uh, you know, talking about strategy and objectives and, and such mm. like, we bonded over um, sampling the local cuisine uh, and just creating those magical moments, um, exploring a new city together. So, so we have something to um, to uh, keep us together. And besides, you know, we, the the very aspect of the work. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, if if you can have some in person uh, communication and and meetups, it's it's great. It's really great. It really does make a difference. I know because I've also met my team members that are working in you know the U.S. and Romania, and when when we meet, it's like wow, <laughs> it it really the connection is much stronger even after you know you leave. So um, yeah, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of maybe the biggest learnings after after mm. the pandemic. And yeah. After yeah. You know, this, it's just you know so so important uh, to <laughs> to exist in the physical world as well. Yeah. Together. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Okay, so to wrap things up, what piece of advice would you give for uh, a localization or uh, either a localization manager or someone that's interested in entering the localization field someone who's like a bit newer to, yeah. to localization uh, if you have any sort of advice or wisdom from your experiences yeah i think if you if you enjoy working um in this space the crossover between language business mm -hmm. technology I think localization industry is a good fit and it's it's an interesting space with a lot of innovation uh, there's a lot going on there's a lot of complexity and diversity in the terms of roles and profiles if you're very very new and you you're looking into breaking into it uh, i'd say maybe join some of the many free localization um, industry events like, mm -hmm. or networking events lock lunch is a good one yeah where, where folks meet and you can you can meet people that are already working in the industry and can give you some, some practical actionable insight or you can see for yourself if that's something for you. I'd say also um, a linguistic background uh, is, is good and is helpful, but it's not a must. I've met a lot of fantastic people working in the industry who come from various different backgrounds. Um, maybe the most important thing is to be proactive and curious about uh, new ways of working um, mm. and new roles that are emerging. Constantly. Yeah, absolutely. I think the localization industry is constantly evolving as our world continues to change very quickly. Um, so that's great advice. So now we have our rapid fire questions. So the idea is it could just be like short answers. Um, so if you're ready, I will start. Um, so what's your favorite language? Mandarin, Chinese. Cool. And your favorite localization tool? Hmm. Uh, localized. Cool. Uh, and a favorite place you've traveled to? Tokyo, Japan. Ooh, love that one. Best localization advice you've received? I think it's to position um, localization as a global growth uh, enabler um, and not a cost center. Yes. Uh, most successful market you've invested in? Mm. We're tracking quite well in most of the markets, most of our focus markets, but I think the, the Netherlands at the moment is, is where we're growing the fastest. Okay. Uh, your localization nightmare? So many. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, strength with no context. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, who is your localization role model? Oh, yeah, also very, very, very hard to choose just one. Uh, but if I have to name a person, uh, I'd say um, Anne-Marie Colliander Lynn. She is uh, the marketing director of Love Worlds. She's a business consultant and she's one of the biggest names uh, and industry leaders here in Scandinavia. Wow, cool. And which brand is your localization crush? So any other company whose localization you admire? Yeah. 
this also changes over time, but at the moment, my crush uh, is Spooky.com because I think they've done a fantastic job with uh, using MT to a very high degree of quality. Awesome. Great. Okay, that was the rapid fire. It's over. Um, so is there anything coming up at Playo that we should be looking out for? Any localization kind of projects that are coming out that you want to shout out? In no, Ukraine, it's... we're um, working on further improving our um, localization quality program. So uh, mm-hmm. we've gone a long way since since the beginning, but there are a few key areas that uh, we're currently focusing on. So one is improving the quality at the source, mm-hmm. and then also increasing context coverage, fine-tuning our LQA scoring, uh, so things like that. So stay tuned. <laughs> okay, great. Going back to your QA roots <laughs> amazing awesome thank you so much diana it was so nice speaking with you and hearing all about your localization insights and wisdom thank you so much corinne thank you for having me on the series it's been a pleasure speaking with you